as I see in this group, um, I guess auto would have fleet and some others would have B2B. Um, so certainly less on the B2G on this call. Okay. So whether it's B2C, B2B, on that revenue line, expect your 20, 30, 40% reduction overall and model what I would consider your worst case scenario. Because I think from there is where you begin to reset your business and now start to think about what does that mean? Worst case, no emotions to it, no judgment to it. And what does that mean from the labor team I need? What does that mean in terms of the rent, whether it's commercial real estate or the other types of real estate that you may have? And then all the subordinating costs for that. And as you do that exercise, you're gonna to come to the realization of what you've probably heard a lot being said in the press, and that is this move to digitalization. If you haven't already accelerated your move to the digital channel, whether it's online transactions or your cost structure being more um, digitally based, you're gonna miss the opportunity to convert your business over the next year or two where this is going to impact the growth of the United States. And by missing that, you're doing two things. You're putting yourself at a competitive disadvantage and you're also not changing your cost structure, right? So this is the moment if, as we think in the turnaround world, is the moment where companies really have to rapidly change their cost structure, right? Because once you do that model, I'm assuming everybody has 20, 40% reduction, right? On this call. So really the only way you're gonna solve that is to control what you can, and that's gonna come in in your COGS, so your cost of goods. But I'm gonna skip that for a moment because I think based on the group here, I'd like to talk about SGNA. The SGNA, if you put a turnaround hat on, um, you really have to change this cost structure. And as entrepreneurs, for those of you, I, I think this is where we have to step away from the emotions of this, and that's often very hard, right? So we have to step away from the emotions of the loyalty of the people that we've had, of the journey that we've had of growing this business, and we have to reset that. And on Oftentimes that's going to be the hardest part of this journey that we see with clients, whether it's the entrepreneurs or oftentimes even the large billion dollar companies. So I think one of the takeaways I would encourage everybody here to have is to strip away the emotions. And again, we're still going through six, eight weeks of this. And it, it, it is a reality that we should accept and, and really not ignore. Because I think once you do that, what you find is this a mindset shift of having a different conversation with employees and with vendors and your landlords, right? Because now you can say, I no longer am getting the foot traffic. So this economic model of renting space by foot traffic is no longer applicable. And this isn't a one, three month thing. This is a two year journey. We need to have a different conversation of what my rent looks like, because if we don't, I will not be profitable and I will not be able to stay. And besides anybody else who's gonna come into this place is gonna have the same model that I do. So let's find a way to work this out together and let's both keep going. That is a different conversation with a commercial real estate landlord. And they're all struggling and you're gonna see a big change in that, in that sector. And like in many businesses and sectors, the ones with the strong balance sheets and the ones who can weather through this are gonna consolidate market space. That may work for you in the commercial real estate because I didn't see everybody except one perhaps in that space. Yeah. But if you're in restaurant retail and you own a chain of five or seven, 10 stores, you're gonna compete against the Wendy's and the Chipotle's and others who have the balance sheet and this corporate support to go after this marketplace and the single mom and pops. So you'll see consolidation. The only way you're gonna be able to succeed in consolidation is with the lower cost structure to ride you out through the next year, through the next two years. Um, so I'll pause there, see if there's any questions because I just um, put <laughs> put a lot out there. And Hillary, I'm open to, yep, to opening up microphones if that's easier or um, to, to have this become Q&A at, at, at this point. 
Yeah, no problem. Um, we do get confirmations mostly around 20% as you were asking. Um, as far as we stand at this moment in time, is there anyone that wants to ask a specific question regarding what Puneet's shared so far? Yeah, what, what specifically could you recommend for a smaller business to be able to compete with someone with a company that does have that balance sheet? I mean, like we have a balance sheet that's healthy compared to the size of our business, but certainly not uh, as large and deep pocketed as what a major company would be. So what, what would you recommend that we do and how uh, could we leverage the balance sheet that we have to possibly acquire other companies? Sure. So in most cases, I, I think this is an opportunity to double down on marketing and customer engagement. That's single first and foremost. And sometimes that's hard because you're thinking, well, how do I do this? I've got so much to do on my plate right now with running the business, that it may be a little counterintuitive, but you have to get out there. I mean, there's a lot of opportunity to engage the client today. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes what you do have that big corporations don't have is the personal connection with the employee, with the customers, but also you have excess capacity of something. If you're on the service side, you have excess labor capacity, engage your clients with offering them some type of what I would call investment. You're not giving it away for free, but invest in your clients to ride out this curve. That does a couple of things, right? It, it keeps your employees engaged, right? It gives them something constructive and productive to do. It's building their skills during that. And three, your customers are seeing value and you're, you're keeping the bonds connected there before one of the other firms can come in. From, from a balance sheet standpoint, I'm going to go back to what I said on the SGNA, right? The only way you can protect your balance sheet is not to drain cash because you're losing money on your PL, right? So the only way you're going to not lose money on the PL is to fix cost structure. The way to fix that cost structure is you have to get the digital component moving, right? So get that online. So you take that investment. If that's the investment you, you are choosing to make between others, I think that's the one that's going to make most sense, no matter what size of a company. And, and this is that opportunity to just, you know, take that carpe diem, right? Seize the day on that. Um, so I, I think that would be it. So what type of business are you in, if you don't mind? Uh, so we do platform and software as a service in the restaurant technology space. Okay, so your clients, you can service more remote um, on, on the yeah. sales side, right? So there, any any business in the sales you know, component, our business included, engaging the FaceTime on the video sales call should be the 100% default assumption. Put that out there, engage your client on the virtual way. And, and even what that means today, we used to go out for lunches, cocktails, and dinners. Put that out there for your clients. I still don't see that as yeah. often or as I think as it should, but why shouldn't you have a working lunch with a potential client and literally have your home food? That is where we're at. And I think that kind of opportunity can get you back to the sales component of what you're doing. And what that also does, if you really analyze that, you save the money of the cost of the meal, you save the money of the flight and the trip, right? So you are redoing your cost structure where we are today. And so that T&E line item is gonna go away. And again, all of these things, as we embrace this digital and this new mindset, I think are going to be the ways that you now can say my T&E is lower. Um, so I hope that helped. May that I makes a lot of sense. Two, may I add on two things that I've been working with my clients on that I think would be really helpful for this group? Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Two things real quick that I wanna um, kind of pull out of what you just said. One, how can you meet, compete with the big guys? The irony is that you can actually leverage your strengths, um, meaning you can move faster. You don't have the levels of bureaucracy. You don't have the approval requirements. So you can move faster for rapid change. What I'm seeing companies do where they kind of are falling short in this right now is that they're pushing product instead of understanding their customer and listening. What your customer wanted six weeks ago may not be what it is today. And where you're going to be success and really uh, capitalize on the advantage to the big guys 
is iterating what the customer needs in a different product and format in a way that the big guys can't. And I'm hearing a lot of companies kind of uh, struggle with that. It, it's truly letting go of what we used to sell and figuring out what your customer base right needs, figures needs right now and delivering on that faster than the big guys can. That's a big advantage. The second thing is um, you mentioned call outreach. So I'm advising all my customers to figure out your asset right now, the biggest asset you have is your existing customer base that already knows you, that loves right. you, that hopefully had yep. a great experience with you. You can downgrade a customer, you can discount a customer, but you lose a customer, the cost to acquire them is more than the cost to give them a little bit something extra right now. So I'm really pushing anyone that I'm working with specifically to over deliver, over communicate and hone in on 100% of retention of your customer base. So just wanted to kind of double down there. Um, I think that there's huge advantages that could be played on uh, versus the big guys and just play on those strengths. So I'll let you take it over from there. Sure. Um, and I see some others that run the professional services with executives, commercial real estate services, two folks from auto. Um, you know, the auto is, in, is interesting. So from a, a foot traffic standpoint, right? Now that entire experience has to change for the auto industry. And that's an industry that all, you know, tends to, to have challenges with engaging customers when they step foot into a showroom. Um, so now they have to change their, their experience for that. Do they do FaceTime and video conversations to, to quote, share the experience of, of selling to a customer? And the showroom is less important now um, for some, or do you set up you know, specific appointments? Sorry, we have a question from yep. Paul Fury. Yes. Go ahead, Paul. Yes. So, you know, in addition to cutting our, our cost, you know, we, we still want to look at protecting our top line revenue or even growing our top line revenue. And, you know, kind of like the old cliche or, or saying, you know, skate to where the puck's going to be. Um, right. You know, coming out of the Great Depression, there's these huge government, you know, infrastructure projects, depending on what happens in November. I think we could really see a, a return to you know, the government being the, the big spender and, and we've never, mm -hmm. in fact, we've run from government projects, government contracts. And now we're like really looking at that as that could be our salvation. You know, that could be where, you know, the money's at. So I'd be interested in just kind of your experiences around companies that either work in the government sector or pivoted to the government sector and kind of the, the mountain to climb there. Sure. So good question. On, on the infrastructure and these kinds of large uh, programs, I think what you find is the opportunities come faster from the, from the city and the state on the government spending side. Um, federal government programs like these big bills um, in any sector, particularly in infrastructure, take one to two years for those programs to really begin, right? Because they go through Congress, they go through funding approvals, then they allocate it to the states, I mean, that alone takes a year and then you've got procurement process, bids, awards, and then you finally hit the ground, you, you tend to think 18 months. So that's gonna be far way out for, for those who are thinking about um, the federal infrastructure programs. Even if they accelerated it, I still think it's you know 12 months. I mean, goodness, nine months could be on the faster side, but uh, you can see like all those different steps that, that have to you know, materialize. Um, for that. But on, on government spending, I think your state and, um, and local may be better opportunities. Plus that gets you into the systems and the contracting process, which processes, which also do take a lot of time of getting your vendor approvals and certifications um, on, that, on that front. Are you in the construction space? No, we do uh, software implementations for uh, Salesforce CRM, oh, but that okay. that includes so a lot of to... apps, you know, building apps and things like that, which I think there might be some government entities that'll want. Got it. Yeah. So I think um, what what we've heard is the federal spending is going to equal or increase, and particularly on IT services, that has been a sector. Um, thank you. Sorry, I'm, I thought you were speaking about real estate infrastructure. My apologies, but on the IT infrastructure side. 
the government spending on the federal side has been consistent. And in fact, many of those businesses, particularly in that DC metro area, have not had to lay off employees because they are getting their federal contracts and they can work remote. So for that standpoint, I think those are opportunities to certainly pursue um, today near term. And I think starting that certification and the vendor application process would be good. Um, on that front, you know, I think you'll find the marketplace will be unique because again, you're gonna have to compete with a lot of other firms. Labor will be available, right? So the cost, your, your labor talent will be cheaper, but there's gonna be a lot of people going after that market. Um, sooner the better on, um, you know, on, on those contracts, because if you have prior experiences tend to help, you know, get those types of business um, from that standpoint. Thank you. Pimit, would you want me to move you to the framework that you wanted to introduce, and then we can move into the kind of the case study with the commercial real estate business? Uh, sure. Yeah. And kind of tackle uh, that. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen as requested. Go ahead. So uh, this is just uh, from Taneo's view. Uh, this is on our website. You know, um, I think we just took a, a quick view here. You know, at the beginning, on the continuum, you've got the society cases decline. The communities demonstrate health. Companies demonstrate health, and then you have your new normal. And I think what what's it's important to take away here is we're literally on the first of these four steps. And how does this affect your revenue curve and your cost curves? I mean, these are um, modeled directly into that um, Excel sheet. So as society cases decline, right, you have this period where I think we're starting now with people and restrictions being eased up. But now what you have to wait for is communities need to demonstrate health, right? So once you have folks who get out and then cases still come up, we can't ignore that you'll have the daily statistics going for the next year. Number of tested, number of infected, and number of deaths. That's going to have a, a change on the mindset of customers who are also employees and of large corporations who are going to make investments or bets and in, in how they're proceeding. Only after that, back and forth, will companies then begin to demonstrate health, both for themselves financially and also for their employees. And then you'll get to the new normal. Now, what's interesting in this is this is not a step function, right? You're going to have, by geography, if you have different locations, the modeling becomes interesting because in city one, like New York, your curve for revenue could look like, you know, a, a peak. If you're then, your second office is in Atlanta, that could start three months later and you could have a different curve with ups and downs. So again, this goes back to when you look at that by geography, by customer segment, by timing, right? You'll find that your revenue curve is the simple story much lower. So let's, again, let's go back to cost, but then let's invest and keep finding new ways to grow sales. So if we scroll to the bottom of this, again, this is on the website, if you just want to take a look at it. And after this call, I've put together a slide um, for Hillary that we talked about, um, which, you know, um, has a lot of different components uh, to it. You know, I can show it here, but Basically, there's about 30 different components that you should be thinking about when it comes to modeling and, and how to think about the drivers external that you don't control, internal ones that you do, and the type of process changes, infrastructure, and people that you have to make. So on the bottom here, you know, we just talk about recovery scenario planning, which I think is what you're doing today um, by joining this call and also the business strategy assessment. And you're also probably executing at this point. So as we've talked about here in this first Chevron on the left, right? We've talked about evaluate current state of ops, business ops, you've done that. The second current state of customer employee response, you've done that. And now you're starting to outline your scenarios. You're now thinking about the business strategy of what does this look like from financial, the communications, my employee risk. I mean, all of these are additional costs that you didn't have before. 
And then the biggest part here is this third bullet point, leverage ongoing intelligence monitoring. But that really has to do with the big lesson to take away from COVID is businesses, no matter how big you are, you have to become more dynamic and instant in your decision-making process. You cannot take the several weeks or the let me go check, let me get approvals, whether you're in larger corporations, these have to be far more quicker and decisive, right? Because as you're managing that revenue curve, you have to react to your customer metrics, your sales metrics, the sales channel that they're coming from, and simultaneously manage your costs um, at, at the same time. So again, just to recap where we've come so far, one, digitize. Two, your cost structure. And three, be far more decisive and quicker in your decision making. And these are all going to be directional bets. You know, I know a lot of people have this notion, I want 90% accuracy, or I need to feel X percent more comfortable. Realistically, you're not going to get there. And accepting that today and becoming not even the 80-20 rule, but embracing more of a 60-40 rule or a 50-50 is gonna help you move down the field, right? And then just constantly revise and pivot and adapt. Um, you know, philosophically, I just call that Dar Darwin, right? It's, it's evolutionary change that we constantly adapt to is more so the case. And that's actually the advice we give clients during turnaround or clients who are about to hit bankruptcy is that the speed of the decision making that they have to make has to be much faster. So um, I hope you take that away from, from today's call and that you feel more comfortable with being uncomfortable. And if it helps, we've already gone through enough discomfort that what I'm asking you is actually easier than everything you've gone through so far. So keep that in perspective you know, as, as well. So with that, Hillary, um, yeah. you know, we, Any we can quick go questions to the other. Or anyone want to kind of take a stab or address something that Pamit said? Sure. Is this helpful? You know, I, again, this is me, you know, just providing perspective and truly my first webinar in this standpoint, but I do this with clients. So I, I treat each of you as one of my clients right here on this call. Um, so I um, hope this is helpful. I see some thumbs up. All right, so let's, um, and let, okay, let's move to uh, the case study. So we will kind of wanted to, instead of keeping Q&A kind of uh, high level 30,000 foot pie in the sky questions, we wanted to drill down and kind of illustrate a way of thinking. So we're gonna start with Rocco and I'll let Rocco introduce himself and his business and kind of the specific problem he's facing right now. So Pamit, you can rip it apart. Right. Okay. Keep me on my toes. Okay. We got you, Rocco. Terrific. Can we unshare the screen that we can go back to maybe the group? Yes. Um, there we go. Great. Awesome. Hi, Pamit. Nice to meet you. And nice to Hello. see everybody here. Even from as far away as Saskatchewan, I'm originally Canadian from Calgary. Mm -hmm. So always great to see a fellow Canadian, especially from Saskatchewan. <laughs> nice to see you, Terry. <laughs> um, uh, so look, we have a commercial real estate business and I, I actually raised my hand for a question earlier. There's two things I'd like just to uh, talk briefly about, but what I shared with Hillary is, you know, it's really hard for us as a company, we have four entities and, uh, and the, and we roll them up. Well, we haven't been rolling them up, but we are starting to, to roll them up into, um, a, um, a singular sort of reserve to, to a singular balance sheet. Right. Um, and, but okay. one of the things that's really hard is when you're scaling for growth is, is modeling during that time and looking at what your, what your economics are going to, how your economics are going to be impacted. So, so one of the things that we started, I started doing when this all happened um, is I started looking at labor efficiency as a mm -hmm. uh, component. There's a model out there that uh, Greg Crabtree has you know, shared with a lot of entrepreneurs and uh, it's, a, it's a pretty simple uh, uh, thing called LER. I don't know if you're familiar with it, Pamit, but uh, um, we went yeah, back and looked at, is... la yeah, labor, your direct labor costs relative to, you know, your, your gross um, uh, sales, your gross revenue. Margin. 
And um, I just, I just, I realized that as we plan for this year, we had, we've been scaling probably 20 to 30% every year. Um, it's been a good time in the economy. And I realized that we got into 2020 or 2020 with, with uh, some investments that we had made and um, uh, looking at last year's gross margin, I mean, in that net profit margin, we, we were right around 11% in a growth year, which wasn't terrible. Um, but we had dwindled our first quarter's gross, uh, I mean, uh, EBITDA uh, to um, 4%. And uh, which, which, you know, I, I feel like we scaled too quickly. Like we didn't see business come before we started making the investments. And when you're in a smaller organization, you have yeah. one or two people can really impact the bottom line. We're about a $4 million That's company cool. last year. And, yeah. you know, you make two or th- one or two hires um, and you're, as you're planning for this growth and all of a sudden you've really hit and we did have a couple of layoffs, but what interestingly, what we did is we gave away um, four of our uh, unprofitable accounts, four accounts that we had felt like. So we gave away about ten thousand dollars a month in recurring revenue, and then we sure. reduced two positions that saved us about fifteen thousand a month. Not to mention the impact it had on all of our accounting people. So I guess the question I have, I have two questions. The first question I have is, how do you model for that? I mean, it's really. For smaller businesses who can't, ha- you know, don't have a CFO, we have a controller, but she's not financially minded mm-hmm. like I am. Okay. Is are there models out there that we can be looking for as entrepreneurs that that are accessible? Um, and I'm not asking you to provide us with one, but is there something that we can be thinking well, about? Are there two or three key components? Then the second part of my question is pricing. Um, I think everybody here is going to be looking at having to reprice the product or the service that they sell. In our case, we have real estate management fees, but I have a portfolio of investment properties that we own that's all pre-COVID. And we're raising our second fund. And I have two assets in that fund that are pre-COVID assets. And so now I'm trying to think, I have eight months to raise and I have obligations while I'm in my raise period to continue to raise for that fund unless I close okay. it out, right? Um, so I guess, I, I think for everybody here, uh, pricing is probably something that's on their mind. How do you, sure. re- I have to reprice that portfolio and yeah. then okay. and then figure out a way to bring more capital in that's going to be interested in dealing with some legacy assets. Um, sure. So sure. I'm starting to throw a lot at you. I mean, we can talk about modeling first, but that hit me that as you were point. talking. Sure. So those are my questions. Um, so you've got two parts. Uh, what's the modeling on, on investments. And I think that's a fair question for everybody on this call is we get the PL, we get the profitability. How do we invest our finite capital going forward? So um, number one, in terms of other models out there, probably, but I'm going to answer your question differently. You actually probably have all the modeling you need. I think the way to look at the ratios is to look at it from a management perspective, right? Because if you're questioning, how do you get your labor ratios? Entrepreneurs are incredibly resourceful. So you've already gotten to a point where you're thinking, I can't afford any more. The the different question to ask for every organization is do I have the right person now, right? So when you have to redo your cost structure, you're also going to find that the talent you have today may not be the talent that goes with you through the rest of the journey. And that's a very different conversation to have, right? Because you're going to have to do more with less. So the skills and the attributes and the traits of the people that you keep going forward need to be different to be more digital, to have different soft skills and to have more technical skills, whether it's finance, accounting, for the back office folks, or how do you engage customers in a sales force that's digital and virtual and isn't in person? So rethinking that goes to this broader transformation of how do you really step back and change your business? And I think if you think of it from there, you'll get to the ratios that are going to make sense. Does that make sense from from that perspective? Yeah. That that does help, but in, in, in but as we're all going to be scaling, pardon me. Sure. 
Yeah, in the near term, sorry, is your question, what do you do now today? Well, yeah, I, well, I mean, I, I noticed as we, I mean, certainly looking at it differently, and I, we do have, I, I, I'm, you know, when I was putting this together for Hillary, it's interesting, I'm like, I kind of know a lot of the answers to all of this. Right. Because it's sort of in front of me, and I realize what, and not sort of in front, it's in front of me, and I realize, wow, we did this. And, but we weren't yeah. thinking as we processed, as we grew, we weren't thinking about, right. all right, we're going to put these three people into play. What are, I mean, it's really hard to predict sales in, uh, in a service business. Sure. You know, like you're, uh, so for us, it's the most predictable revenue that we have is when we buy a property. Yeah. Right? And that's where we create the most enterprise value. Sure. Um, and I just, so I, I, I had the answer, but I was, I was looking forward to, I, I feel like for, for entrepreneurs, as we're planning growth and we're making these investments, being yeah. able to realize the return that we're getting on them is a I, challenge. I, but I do agree with you that we have, like, we have to think very carefully about how we are going to, um, uh, uh, you know, what do we have the right people in the right seats? That's right. We feel pretty good about that. Okay, good. So as a New Yorker and, and a consultant and advisor, I'm going to just tell you as I tell all my clients, clients usually do have 99% of the answers. And, and I think you do as well. And when companies scale, whether it's small business or Fortune 100s, the reason they, they look back in hindsight and say we should have comes back to the decision-making and having a number that you stick to, right? So when you lay out your plan and you say, I'm going to invest X dollars and I expect to have this revenue hit this curve, what most people do is they keep burning the cash and burning the money and they don't revisit the original decision because they have the selection bias of, no, well, I couldn't be wrong. So really it's more about being true to the conviction that you have to make a decision that you probably don't emotionally want to make. And that would stop the bleed, or that would stop the investment. Or it would force a different conversation of, how do I change my cost structure? Because I still believe in this, but it's not what I had three months ago when I started this. Here's what I've learned. Here's how I need to pivot. And what clients tend to do is they keep repeating what they did for those three months without any additional pivot. And I think that goes back to what I was saying about earlier. The thing about the COVID that's going to test organizations is their ability to gather information, inform, and make a decision that is tweaked and not just keep sticking to what they were doing before, right? Because that's the biggest part. As we get more and more information, the original set of information you had when we made a decision and a three-year plan or a one-year plan is in effect void, right? Whether it's an L shape, a U shape, a V shape, there's a new set of data three months in. And you should reset that entire conversation and you'll find a different answer at that point. And it's in that moment to, to accept and say, hey, I need to pivot, I need to change. And that's not working. It's minus 2%. We were projecting positive 7%. Let's do this. So I think that would be the big advice is to relook at that by facts and then have the conversation and then decide and execute, but you have to pivot and not keep repeating. Because if you're repeating, you're repeating something where your macroeconomic has changed, your consumer behaviors have changed, your competitors have changed. Um, so all your different stakeholders have changed the way they are. So you also have to do that as well. So did that help from- Yeah, yeah it helped a lot. Um, <clears throat> so I guess the only other thing I would say is, do you always tell, I mean, with smaller companies, I mean, we have a lot of small, you know, all small yeah. entrepreneurs here. Do you have, um, do you say to them, listen, keep your margin, always keep your margin yeah. here, you know? So you're gonna, that opened up the segue to pricing. So, you know, when I opened this call, and by the way, even if you're a nonprofit, right? This is the same, everything has a PL, whether you're for profit or nonprofit, because I think there's two or three nonprofits on this call as well. You have to stay true to the margin. 
because that ultimately is the cash that you're going to burn and deplete from your balance sheet. And that is the moment of the decision making that you have to make is do I feel comfortable, keep running this, add a negative cash loss? Because do I really believe and see and do the facts say that I can keep running this business as is and hope my way into the profit? And those are the decisions that I, I would encourage clients to make quite frequently. You know, every business is different, but if you think two weeks ago and four weeks ago and six weeks ago, would you be making the same decisions today that you read back then? No, absolutely not. So does that give you a guide or an indication on the frequency? Yeah, I mean, you should check every two weeks because every two weeks there's some new change to unemployment, there's new change to corporations. So I think the frequency of changes and input and data that we have to cycle through would be the best advice to any size company in any type of organization. And that by itself is a huge transformation change for organizations because they're still lingering back in the ways that they used to do business and they're not rapidly adapting. If it's any, so if it's any pricing, benefit, yeah. So on, on pricing, um, yeah, you have to hold true to profit. And, and if you're going to make the, the decision to invest, well, be true and honest about how much you plan and, and how long over time, right? So that becomes the, the duration criteria in your model. How long do I want to invest and lose money on my P&L and to how much amount? And then the timing of that. Do I lose a little up front and then as it grows, hit the brakes? Or am I willing to start high? because I wanna get market penetration. Like if you have the strategic decision, that's great, but then reevaluate the business case. But fundamentally, I personally would never waver on, on margins. You have to continue to do things to be a profitable company. And if you don't, then make that a clear, de clearly defined time period and amount of when you choose to lose money and then re-pivot from there. So pricing, you know, is very different in every industry. It's what your competitors are doing. It's what your marketplace. But the thing you can control in pricing, again, goes back to that cost structure. The only way you're going to become not only profitable, but even competitive is to getting ahead of reducing your cost structure by going back to finding a different way to run your business, digitalization, online, scaling, move stuff to the cloud, lower the labor costs that you your team members have. I mean, that is a big takeaway of COVID. And, and most of the clients on this call, professional services, moving away to a lower labor cost model is the plan. And I think that's the conversation you should be having. And your top three initiatives on that, you should then focus on that. What investments do I need to make, right? So when you talk about consolidation, all right, so I've done many mergers before. When we go from four to one, in any one of those, when we look at consolidation, we look at the processes, the systems, the tools, the assets. Again, assets are both tangible and intangible assets. And how do you change all of that while you're doing it? Because you have this window and you have this opportunity to make all these changes, rip the Band-Aid off and, and start that um, that pivot now. So by doing all of that gets you a better pricing because maybe you can keep your pricing and have better EBITDA. And you may not have that today, but at least you can say, I'm going to invest six months of negative loss because it's going to take me four months to put this infrastructure in place, four months to retrain my people, two months to find somebody else, two months to train them. And by the way, I have to train myself too. That's the fifth thing I want you to take away from this. How you manage your organizations has to radically change as well. Because if you're going into rapid decision making, if you're going into rapid intelligence gathering, you have to feel comfortable to delegate more opinions and information to your junior team members and then finding a new way for yourself to engage them that has been historically different, perhaps hierarchical or whatever that model you had has to change going forward 
to have organizations really come and, and be different. So um, I so mean, hope that helped, Rocco, on, on that one. Oh, yeah, thanks very much. I mean, I appreciate the shares. Excellent. So. So I'm gonna, if, if, it, if everyone's okay with this, we'd like to move to a place of kind of rapid fire questions. So anyone who hasn't had a chance to ask her a question, I'm all about inclusion and letting everyone get a piece of value out of this, whether it's one big golden nugget or a small one. So I'm gonna invite anyone who's comfortable, who hasn't yet shared a question. Um, we're gonna, uh, I'm gonna ask you to ask the question in 60 seconds or less and Pamit's gonna answer it in 60 seconds or less with our okay. goal of, of getting five questions in, okay? So I need one person to volunteer their question first. So I invite, oh wait, Ziad, I'm sorry. Ziad, go ahead and unmute yourself, yep. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, you can hear me, right? Yes. The, uh, quick question, so we're more, of, I'm a general manager of an auto dealership, Hyundai dealership. Um, we're, we're looking at labor, labor um, reducing labor costs, but at the same time, I think we're looking more of um, gaining market share right now. Right. Uh, people are still going to be buying vehicles, and uh, we're looking more into the virtual aspect, but there's also right. the um, investment that you have to make going into that. And you're talking about quick decisions, and yeah. um, we're, we're at a time right now where we're kind of just sitting here we got some uh, software companies staring at us and we need to make some quick decisions. We just don't know if we should jump in it right away or, or we need to wait and see how quarter two, you know, works out. It's a, uh, uh, it's just something that's sitting there staring yeah. at us. In, in general, um, going as a, as an auto business, I mean, your owners, your franchise or your, the families who own these dealerships, over time, constantly will look at compressing SGNA costs, right? And they yeah. will work to get labor costs out. Yeah. So the decision about software is inevitable. And this yeah. is the moment to do it now because you can. There's less people around. So even the organizational change and the change management is going to be easier to take that window now, right? It is a spend you're going to do. And because you in the automotive sector are going to see light and demand for quite some time, yeah. this is the moment to get change with IT projects, which nobody ever likes, and mm -hmm. to do that now. So I think sooner the better. And again, you're fixing your cost structure, which is going to be key because if you're not hitting the number of car sales per month and right. you're certainly not getting revenue in the service base, you need right. to find the margin and the margin will be in IT in the, in the SGNA. Thank All you. right. Perfect. Okay. That was 60 seconds. I have a timer. All right. Okay. Next question. Uh, who's up next? We have Billy, Greg, Erica, Florence, Damon, Wendy, Jane. I like this rapid q and It keeps me... Uh... Yeah, let's dig deep. Ask a specific question. Let's tackle it. Hi, this is Alpha. I Alpha. want to ask a question. All right. 30 seconds, Alpha. So you just spoke of um, really engaging junior staff in this process of making yeah. rapid decisions. As someone who is starting out in their career and really junior, I really see the value of that because the lower you are, the more you're closer to the work. How can someone in my position really leverage their voice to senior leadership? Mm, great question. Um, take everything that I said today and you present those as your ideas upwards, right? <laughs> That's really it. <laughs> you know, you need, you, need to, you need to tell your, your, the senior leadership, ask them to say, what does your revenue curve look like? Mm -hmm. What is the EBITDA and what investments are we making? And what decisions do you need to know? Because I'm seeing A, B, and C, right? Go into that conversation with, here's what I'm seeing from a revenue standpoint. Here's where I think we can be faster, better, cheaper on our operations. And here's the old processes that don't work. And here's my recommendation. And you have the ideas. And oftentimes what we find all the time is information from the front line rarely makes it to the top. Or when it does, it's always discounted or hedged or um, fear of making a mistake. You have a window um, and sees it. So, if you can go and speak in financial terms, 
that's really what's going to resonate with the leadership because 90% of this call was all about the finances and the process and the org change. So I think if you go with that, you will no longer be a junior person. <laughs> and I will, I will add to that, you, that this provides an opportunity for you to test leadership. How That's they right. respond is an indicator of whether you should be in that organization or not. And I think that elevates society as a whole. All right, next question. Who's up? Florence, Damon, Greg, uh, Benjamin. I can ask a quick one. Go for it. Oh, right. What do you think, uh, uh, Penny? What do you think about virtual assistants? One of the things that we're talking about uh, doing in terms of la reducing labor costs mm -hmm. is really focusing on processes, as you mentioned. So yeah. um, we feel like we have accounting costs and we have administrative costs that we and and now that we have social distancing, all right. this office space that we have, we can only use we have to use less of it, right? Or yeah. we can put, we can fit fewer people there. You're coming in to buy a company and you see that they've got all of their accounting systems are overseas. What do you, how do you right. judge that company? How do you what? How do you judge that company? What do you think? I mean, should companies be outsourcing? Should companies be using virtual assistants? Is that a positive for you as you evaluate a company that you think about acquiring or you're doing M&A work or is that like, whoa, 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 wait. Yeah. Too um, much in in M&A, so I do a lot of operational due diligence, financial due, due diligence. We tend to first look at what is the EBIT improvement from that decision, number one. Number two, what is the direct and hidden labor costs required to run that software, right? So it's not just about, is this X cheaper, but how much is the, the labor cost, the management, the oversight, all those stacked costs on it? Um, what's that impact going to be? Uh, but to answer your question, yes, we love reducing the um variable fixed cost within the SGNA. And these types of offshoring or virtual assistance um, tend to help self-serve customers a lot easier, which is less time of their day, right? So they're putting 15% less of their day answering phone calls, emails, et cetera. That unlocks them to do other tasks and activities. So we look at that from a productivity standpoint and also from a lower cost on a variable. And again, as you go LUVW Nike swoosh, you want to have the lowest fixed cost possible. And back to um, Ziad from the auto dealership question, these are all things that you want going into the next year or two is to have that variability factor, right? Because you don't know at every business, the growth is gonna come at a different speed and intensity. And by having these platforms ready today, um, it's easier for you to, to take advantage of those opportunities. It's easier to hire after the curve. So the thing you have to do now is make the investments now so you're ready to scale in, in the steep hockey curve. So awesome. That, I think we're at the top. Yeah, I want to respect everyone's time. Is there one last question we want to cover who didn't have a chance to speak? Yeah, I've got one actually. Um, we've been talking about B2C and digitalization, but what about B2B? I think one of our biggest things is B2B uh, sales that's impacted. Sure. You said digital has gone through yeah. the roof and we're doing really well on that side of the business, but B2B is really suffering. And so a lot of that is, of course, yeah. um, that we sell to retail shops and their doors are closed. Right. When you talk about the footprint, I'm a bit worried you know, we've got this whole sales team that we're still investing in that we've, we haven't laid off. And right recommend in that tough scenario? Yeah, the, the B2B space from a labor standpoint, you know, the trend we're seeing is most clients are really cutting back on labor to, to, to be direct. And that's primarily driven on the demand dropping from many of the businesses for, for the near term. So that's the, the quick and perhaps hard answer. But the clients who are doing well are the ones who've made that decision today and then will hire back as they grow into the curve. Um, in turnaround situations, um, the more effective approaches over time and over the long run, long run are the ones that actually cut deeper, quote, than they should or feel like they should. Um, because there's a lot of human bias that to those final spreadsheets when people say, but I don't wanna lose this person or that person or that person. But if you move the emotions away, you'll find that that curve where it needs to be it is much lower. And that's really the opportunity for clients to become far more <clears throat> resourceful 
far more innovative because necessity is the mother of all invention. And you want that for your organization. And that's the bigger long-term perspective. So with B2B, you know, I'd tell you guys to, to really have a harder conversation of what a labor cut looks like because that demand curve is gonna drive your profitability. So I, I think that would really be the case um, for you guys, as difficult as that is, and as difficult as it is for me to say that to you, because I understand that there's are people um, behind that. Um, but you also have to look at the entity itself. Um, so I, I hope that helps that, except that B2B is, is soft. And again, servicing a B2B client is also gonna be very different. That's gonna become more commoditized and transactional because there's so many other competitors and you don't have that engagement level. And unless you've got a unique product or quality or item, supply chains are gonna change. So you really have to hedge across 20 different factors that you don't control, but you do control your margins. So ride this out would be um, the advice I would have. Sorry, it's not better news, but <laughs> all right. All right. Well, thank you, Pamit. Thank you, everyone. It's so nice to see your wonderful faces. Um, uh, is anyone final words? Everyone's want to share. Pamit, wow. awesome, amazing, always. Well, thank you. My first webinar. <laughs> Thank you for joining tonight. We're stealing you from corporate. <laughs> Excellent. Right. Um, maybe so Hillary much. and I will do. Maybe Hillary and I will do a second one on another topic. So. <laughs> All right, we're rooting right. for you. Ciao. Thanks. Nice seeing you, Greg. Eric, see you, and everyone. Thanks, everyone, for your participation. Bye. Hey, Wendy. <laughs> All right. All right, I'm gonna give you a call. Okay. <laughs>